name is Barry Rabe. I'm a professor here at the Ford School and director of the Center for Local State <coughs> Policy, which is just delighted to host today's event. Uh, this event directly links to close up energy and <coughs> Policy Initiative, which is interested in a range of issues at the intersection of energy development and environmental protection, including shale gas, including fracking. Um, this is a special edition of a public event for us, in that not only is this open to the general community, we have so many folks with us today, but it's also very closely linked to a major teaching initiative in the Ford School, namely Professor Paul Caron's uh, Public Policy 201 class thinking analytically about the problems of the day, which is Paul's brainchild idea, way to bring uh, public policy questions to Michigan undergraduates in a very, very unique way. So this is actually part of a module in Paul's class, and we're delighted to have so many of the students from 201 with us this morning as we've been talking about issues of disclosure, environmental protection, energy, and even shale. So we link those two together. Uh, the question of disclosing information to the general citizenry is an enduring <coughs> question in political systems like the United States, but really around the world. This comes up in almost every arena of public policy, almost every area that the Ford School faculty and students engage in. This question of information, disclosure, access to information, how you present that information, what information is not disclosed, is a <coughs> perennial issue in question. Perhaps nowhere is that issue as sensitive and conflictual or potentially conflictual as in issues of energy and environment. And so this gives us a, a very interesting opportunity to think about this inter intersection in some very creative ways. Let me introduce the folks who are going to be speaking today in reverse order that you'll be hearing from them. We hope to have time to open up Q&A to a larger audience, but we have a large agenda today. So we actually have an expert panel of questioners. And I'm delighted to welcome Sarah Gossman, from, who came across the way from the University of Michigan Law School. Uh, Sarah took a lead role in some of the great work that the Graham Institute has done on the issues of, of shale gas and hydraulic fracturing in Michigan wrote one of the technical reports that was submitted to the state that deals actually with disclosure issues extensively. Uh, she will be raising a question in q and I've already introduced uh, Paul Courant, a member of the faculty here and holder of many current and former administrative roles at the university. <laughs> Uh, and always a thoughtful commentator, and delighted to have both Cassie Brown and Colleen Campbell, who have been uh, the GSIs for this course, all will have an opportunity to ask questions at the very end of our event. Then if we have time, we will open things up. With that, let me turn to our two speakers and two uh, main topics. What we were really interested in doing here is looking at the larger experience with information disclosure programs in the <coughs> environmental protection arena. What is the history? What are the lessons? And when you have that conversation, you often turn to the one dominant program, the Toxics Release Inventory of the federal government, a program that's been in place now for over a quarter of a century, although it was modeled heavily on the experimentation underway in a number of states prior to that time. The TRI has been used extensively, has been studied extensively, but we're very pleased today to have uh, the author of the leading political science interpretation of, of that, that book. Before I say a few more words about uh, my craft, I want to also welcome um, Chris Borick. Uh, Chris is a wonderful partner for Close Up in every possible way. As many of you know, Close Up has expanded its survey research into issues of energy and environmental protection, particularly with a focus on the role of state and local governments. Chris directs an extraordinary institute, a student-run institute at Muhlenberg College in Allentown, Pennsylvania, that does extraordinary work in public opinion, even holds a very, very high Nate Silver ranking. Uh, <laughs> so you know he's the real deal, uh, and is partnering with uh, on us with a whole range of, of issues and questions. Chris will actually follow Mike and provide a bit of input that we have been able to discern thus far through some of our work uh, related to public opinion on the issue of shale gas, fracking, and questions of <coughs> disclosure. But he will follow Mike Kraft, and it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Mike here. Mike is the Herbert Fisk Johnson Professor of Political Science and Public Affairs Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. I do not want to repeat that sentence again. <laughs> uh, for many years, Mike has really played a central role 
in bringing the tools of the discipline of political science to a range of environmental policy issues. He is the author and editor of the two premier textbooks on environmental politics and policy, which have been frequently, routinely used in both undergraduate and graduate courses on this campus uh, and campuses really all around the United States. Um, has worked extensively in a range of areas and with a pair of colleagues, Mark Stefan and Troy Abel, produced an extraordinary book called Coming Clean, Information Disclosure and Environmental Protection, uh, published by MIT Press just about a year and a half or two years ago. This book has already received the Linton Keith Caldwell Award from the American Political Science Award Association. It is the highest APSA award for a book on environmental politics and policy, and in effect, tells the story of the TRI, the Toxics Release Inventory. But looking very much, not so much exclusively at corporate behavior, although that's a key component in much previous research, but the governmental aspects and how different states respond and use this tool. So we've given Mike a really interesting challenge this morning. How do you take an arena where you've spent a lot of time and spent a lot of research looking at the TRI and then begin to apply it to a new arena? which was not really being thought of at the time the TRI was created or for most of it being implemented, namely shale gas and hydraulic fracturing with horizontal drilling. How do you begin to even think about transitioning lessons from that one experience to another or can one? So Mike's presentation will focus very heavily on the experience and lessons from the, from the TRI, transition toward issues of shale gas toward the end, He'll then hand the baton to Chris Bork for a, a deeper dive into some of the issues of shale related to public opinion, and then we'll open it up into Q&A. Without further comment, please join me in welcoming Mike Kraft. Thank you, Barry. Is this mic on now? Well, thanks very much, Barry, for the introduction. We'll be mindful of the time, and, and I'm very happy to be here and to talk about the the TRI, um, we're not going to cover everything in the book. It's about a 280-page uh, book. I've got 40 minutes to take you through uh, a lot of material. So let's start. The outline, sorry from the title. I didn't mean to put the title on the outline. Is it? So I'll give you a little bit of background. I think many of you already have studied uh, natural gas fracking. We can be very brief on that as to why, why this has become an important issue and the role of information disclosure. And, and I would just say right out, I don't think merely disclosing chemical information about fracking is going to accomplish very much at all, as you will see. It will turn on how you design a disclosure policy, what you release, how it's interpreted, and how much the public can understand. There's a lot of misconception about the TRI program, which we'll go into as I review the history of, of that a bit. So I'll, I'll present, as Barry said, some of the findings from the Coming Clean book. Uh, but also to try to draw that out a bit. Some of the findings are pretty technical, and I did supply their, I think there are about 31 or 32 slides here. We'll skip over some of them, uh, but uh, the, the full presentation is available for those who want it. And I guess it's been posted already on a site that you can access. So what strikes me as interesting about the uh, fr fracking issue, it's developed very rapidly. Uh, this is unlike many other industries. And of course, this is part of the larger context of uh, energy concerns, environmental concerns. United States has, has moved remarkably fast to developing domestic sources of oil and gas. That has greatly reduced our dependence on foreign oil. Uh, that's the uh, energy security aspect, energy independence, as we used to see back in uh, Ford and uh, the Gerald Ford School. Uh, we talked a lot about energy independence, and, and the reality is it kept uh, the reliance on imported oil kept going up every year, and only under Barack Obama has it actually declined from about 60% to 40%. That's because of, of, uh, of fracking in part. Um, <clears throat> uh, the other interesting thing about uh, fracking activities on a policy end is it's been mostly at the state level, and that's because Congress in its wisdom pretty much excluded federal regulation. So it's, it's been left up to the states. The states have taken um, uh, quite a varied response, but generally have been friendly to the fracking industry because it's producing energy at low cost and, and creating jobs. And, and only more recently, have, I keep hitting the wrong button here, have uh, environmental groups uh, been calling for a ban uh, more and more, it seems, in the, in the past year. Uh, but natural gas production has soared. Prices have declined. Uh, that's made a big difference to a lot of industries. It's a reason why many coal-fired power plants are not protesting even more because they're switching over to natural gas. In the state of Wisconsin and one other state, nuclear power plants have shut down, saying the main reason for doing that is they can't be competitive with natural gas 
fired plants. Some may view that as a good thing and some you know, not. And like you know, reviewing any energy source is problematic because there are multiple criteria you have to take into account. One obviously is cost and efficiency, and sometimes that's the only consideration. Uh, what we're talking about today is the environmental and health impacts. And every energy source has some. Even putting solar panels in the southwest desert, you know, you know, there are environmental groups concerned about the desert tortoise. So there's no, benign, no, no completely benign source of energy. Uh, and we're concerned, um, as I say, about energy security as well. Uh, mostly we're focusing today, and the importance of the TRI here is on the health and environmental effects of using natural gas. And I'm not really going to talk about methane leakage, but some people are actually more worried about that than they are about fracking chemicals. And that's because natural gas is appealing because it has fewer greenhouse gas emissions than coal. The problem is if you have only a little bit of methane leakage, it wipes out the difference between natural gas and coal. So it really becomes important. And aside from information disclosure, regulation of natural gas could mean tighter pipelines that don't leak and more care. But it, as far as I can tell, nobody really knows how much methane is leaking because we haven't studied it carefully, and that's something that's very important. Mostly the concern is the effect on water quality, and that's the concern of the chemicals that are injected. I think most of you know it's a combination of sand, some of which comes from Wisconsin, when we mine that sand. Sand and water and chemicals, uh, mixture chemicals, some of which we know about, some of which the companies that drill for oil and gas don't like to disclose because they claim that would be an unfair advantage to their competitors. Uh, and we're talking about especially the impact of the, for the fracking chemicals on health. Presumably they would be transported by a drinking water or surface water that would somehow affect people. And what does this have to do with information disclosure? Because people uh, are attracted to this notion that we have a right to know about chemicals in the environment that could adversely affect them. It's a pretty simple principle, kind of rooted in ethics uh, and has a long tradition, as Barry said, at the state level as well as at the federal level. Uh, in many uh, areas, so it's been widely used, and by the way, I would draw this distinction as we do in the book. Information disclosure is not the same as releasing information, because typically when you say disclosure, it means mandatory disclosure. It's an, still a non-regulatory policy, but merely releasing information voluntarily is not the same as information disclosure that's compelled by law. It's widely used, food labels, drug safety, drinking water quality. Uh, one of the earliest efforts actually campaign finance. We may not think of it that way. Campaign finance is basically a disclosure policy. There's very little regulation, especially these days. It's that you can find out who is contributing, unless, of course, that one of the organizations that file under a certain IRS rule where you don't get the full disclosure. So it's widely used. I think it's easy to understand. There's a belief here that if people have information, they will use the information. This therefore empowers people. And particularly for the toxics release inventory, I think there's a lot of belief that it empowers communities to respond to community-wide threats. Um, and uh, to address some of those concerns, uh, we'll draw uh, from the, uh, the book that I did with, with uh, Troy and uh, Abel and Mark Stefan. And I would say we started with uh, a proposition that uh, maybe the mechanisms through which disclosure policies work aren't really understood well, and maybe they don't work the way most people think they do. TRI is, as uh, Barry indicated, the prime example at the federal level of resign, relying on information disclosure. It's been in effect now since 1986 when SARA, Superfund Amendments Act, was passed. It's widely considered to be the leading federal non-regulatory environmental program of this kind. Uh, the law mandates annual reports. This, uh, I should clarify, some of you know the history of this. It only apply, it doesn't apply to every company, it applies to those that are above a certain threshold. And that threshold is defined in terms of the size of the company, number of employees, and the pounds of chemicals released. There are about 20,000 companies that release these reports in recent years, but there are many others that fall below the threshold. In our study, we actually found, interestingly, companies knew where that threshold was. They would try to get just under it so they didn't have to file the paperwork. So you're not getting everything. You're getting only those companies that, because of their size and production levels, you know, uh, uh, exceed those limits. In the most recent years, it's about 20,000, 21,000 companies. There's a vast amount of information there. What I tried to underscore in the, in the, in the slides we'll go through is that TRI is widely considered to be effective and widely considered to be doing what it was designed to do, to inform the public. And the evidence cited is that the release of toxic chemicals has declined precipitously since the beginning, since that first report in 1988. 
the number widely cited is from 1988 to about the year we finished work on the book, uh, about 2007 or so, the decline was about 61%, okay, with a caveat. It's hard to measure over time because the TRI chemical list keeps changing. It's up to over 650 now, but to track over time, you obviously can't include those that weren't on the list to begin with. So you have to only track core chemicals. So core chemicals, about 286 of them, have declined. But we really can't speak to the historical change for other chemicals. And I looked just last week again at the latest TRI report. They're no longer even providing the historical uh, change. So I, I can't tell whether we're getting better or worse, they have a, a period I'll show you more recently, but they don't any longer go back to 88, which they did just a few years ago. So what we asked about, because this is what intrigued us, why should a program that is non-regulatory achieve the kind of effects that it does? And I think this leads us to believe um, there must be some mechanism by which if a company releases information, this changes their behavior in some way. I guess I had that on a later slide. Uh, and so let me come back to that. So it, the assumption is releasing information will change the way people think and the way communities respond, but also does something within the corporation. Because once they know, gosh, now everybody can see what we're doing, we better not do something wrong. And I think there's an assumption this is, an, this is you've changed the internal motivation for production. Even if the community doesn't respond to the information, that internal change is taking place. And I guess the same is expected to be true of fracking. If, there's, if you have to disclose, maybe you don't want to do things you'd be embarrassed to disclose. In fact, the, the TRI has been described by one of my colleagues who wrote an article on it. It's called Regulation by Embarrassment. It's technically non-regulatory, but there's the embarrassment factor. You, want, you don't want to be ashamed of doing something the community, especially the local community, is going to blame you for. So, why not just have regulatory policies? And I think that the backdrop to looking at disclosure is disclosure is called a non-regulatory response. Regulation meaning we'd have a US EPA or Department of Environmental Protection that would set standards and you'd hire staff to enforce the standards and companies that violate the standards would be subject to some legal sanctions. Regulation is pretty complicated, as Dan Fiorino puts it in his book from 2006, and we have an elaborate system of reporting, inspections, and penalties to make people follow the rules. Corporations like people don't really like rules. They, they, they don't want somebody telling them how to run their business, and regulation has been, gone through several phases of change in the last 30 years. Uh, part of, let me come back to that, but uh, there are a very large number of facilities in this. You know, we're a big country, so there are a lot of facilities. One reason regulation can't work is you can't hire enough people and have enough agencies spending enough money to regulate everybody. My students were often surprised to hear that most companies are not inspected not only weekly or monthly, not even annually. Some go years and years without a single inspection. So the information that's released, particularly in a TRI type program, is information the company releases uh, on its own volition, more or less, and it, it chooses how to uh, compile the information. But regulation is less, can I put, regulation is less regulatory than it seems, because the, the notion that a, a monitor or a regulator is looking over the shoulders of corporate executive 24 hours a day is clearly, not, it, it may work in meat packing and, and, and some pharmaceutical companies, this is not the way it works in environmental protection. Companies are pretty much implementing uh, policies on a voluntary basis with occasional inspections and penalties imposed. But we also have a political reaction to regulation, which is, is heavily criticized, uh, particularly, of course, by those who are more conservative, who don't like government regulation and, and, and the spending and don't like private decision-making in corporations uh, imposed. But it's criticized also because invariably it's bureaucratic. You have to set up a US EPA. EPA has about 17,000 employees. Uh, state agencies, that, that, even though I would argue it's not nearly enough, it makes it the largest federal regulatory agency, so it's the subject of frequent criticism. It's prescriptive, as I was saying. Agencies, by definition, are setting rules and regulations and enforcing them. That means companies and individuals uh, can't do what they might prefer to do. In the U.S. system, uh, this is a kind of long-standing criticism. It tends to be adversarial by its nature, again. P people fight the rules, they may sue the EPA when the agency finally develops its greenhouse gas regulations for coal fire power plants. I guess I put the 
probability it's somewhere near 100%, they're going to go to court for years to defend it, no matter how carefully they develop it. That's the adversarial system. It's also fragmented. The EPA works with the states in enforcing laws. Most of the day-to-day -day regulation is done at the state level with federal oversight. It's highly varied across the states. Barry is a nationally recognized student of that phenomenon. So uh, it's, it's not, a, not as uniform and hierarchical a system as you might think. And then economists have other criticisms. It's inefficient that you, it, companies are spending much more money than they need to if we could impose some kind of economic um, uh, device, if we could have uh, economic incentives and disincentive market-based approaches. Uh, they argue that would be more efficient. And to some extent, I think they would say it would be more effective because you get away from relying on this cumbersome system of regulation. Now, what's interesting is most of the environmental laws we have date back to the early to mid-1970s. Virtually all the major environmental protection statutes were enacted between 1970 and 1976. There have been amendments since then, none of which has been all that significant. Despite all the criticism from 1970 to the present, especially the, from the Reagan 80s to the present, almost nothing has changed. And if you know the way the current Congress operates, I think it's safe to say nothing's going to change uh, in the near term. Uh, they can't agree on a budget. They can't agree on much of anything. Uh, uh, and so political gridlock almost ensures we're stuck with the system we have, even if alternatives like information disclosure or market-based approaches make more sense. <clears throat> what has the outcome, be, uh, outcome been for uh, the, the regulatory system we have on air quality, water quality, toxic chemicals? Generally good, I think. Uh, we have some pretty good data on air quality. It's definitely improved quite a bit since 1970, dramatically in some cities. Uh, the number of unhealthy uh, days in most major cities has declined quite a bit. Water quality is a bit more problematic, but let's not dwell on that now. The problem with regulation is I think it's, it's reaching the limits of what it can do. And there are some problems, most notably I put up here, indoor air pollution and non-point source water pollution, farm runoff, urban runoff. Re regulation simply cannot address those. There are too many, too many uh, sites. You obviously can't regulate every home in the country that has radon leaking in from the, from the basement. So you rely on things like information disclosure and voluntary testing and guidelines and education and maybe some kind of market incentives. You could make radon testing kits free if you wanted to do it, something like that. So there's been a lot of discussion in the last several decades about alternatives to regulation such as market incentives and information disclosure. And what we decided to do was to put this, put our study of the TRI in that context. That is, how can information disclosure be assessed for its potential to do a better job than conventional regulation? So we selected the, pre the premier federal program, the Toxic Release Inventory. As I said, it was part of the, uh, uh, the SARA uh, Superfund rewrite called the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, EPCRA, 1986. Interestingly, it uh, took the Bhopal chemical accident in India, which I, still is, I believe is still considered to be the most serious industrial accident the world has ever experienced. You get different counts of how many people were killed and injured, but uh, it uh, was a very severe accident, and that prompted Congress to finally enact this. Many states had already developed policies of this kind. Uh, now, so again, the, the key assumption, if you release information, people will come. People will find the information pertinent. They will devour it. They will, uh, they will talk to their neighbors. They will, they will petition companies to cut back. That was, I think, the assumption, because it seemed a logical assumption. If only people knew what they were breathing and what was in their water, they would naturally not want something adverse to continue. It, it makes sense, it's just that it doesn't work like that, and I don't know that it ever did. So again, I reviewed the numbers. EPCRA mandates annual public reports from about 21,000 facilities currently on over 650 yeah. uh, chemicals. The progress on the original core chemicals was quite substantial, and the most recent report, which is uh, came out in January of this year, covers data through 2011, says another 8% decrease. My suspicion is we're nearing the end of the decreases because I can't see you uh, going to make more progress. That 8% would mean for all the chemicals that were, I, actually I'm not sure about that. I'm assuming they're counting all the chemicals that were on the list in 2003. Again, they're still adding chemicals. So EPA for years has said EPA is a resounding success. They actually, about 10 years ago in 2003, they produced a report on how TRI data are used. They had selected case studies, what social scientists call anecdotal data, uh, 
And they said it was a resounding success. Communities were mobilized, people took action, they, they got companies to change their behavior. And we did not find that in our study, which was a systematic nationwide study. And I don't believe EPA has ever done more than that little 2003 study to find out how this works. There's another problem. Despite all the progress, the amount of chemicals being released to the environment is still prodigious. You know, we're a big country, got a lot of companies. It's four billion pounds a year. These are not all chemicals. These are the chemicals on the TRI list. Uh, and more recently, they've started some new categories. Some of these were on the list, but they've, these are overlapping categories, but uh, the things that are more likely to disturb people. What we call PBT chemicals, persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic. Things like lead, mercury with neuro neurotoxins, PCBs, polycyclic aromatic compounds. And, and again, this is part of the larger 835 million pounds of carcinogens. My guess is if you had a TRI report that said a local company is releasing thousands of pounds of carcinogens to the air, and you're downwind from that company, you wouldn't be happy to hear that. Uh, but it's awfully hard to track exactly what's being released. Well, if you go to the TRI report, you will see some nice colorful graphs that look like this. I'll go through these quickly. Uh, so there's the four billion pounds. I personally would be much more concerned about the air releases than anything else because that's what you're breathing. The, the water, it's not clear you're going to get exposed through the other kinds of releases. So land disposal, surface water discharges, injection. We have an awful lot of injection wells around the country and that might eventually affect groundwater, but it's not supposed to. It's supposed to be injected in a way it stays put if you're confident about that. So, but still 20% to the air. Um, then there's another category called production related waste management, and here you again see the, uh, so some of uh, the chemical waste that's produced is used for energy recovery, some is recycled, some is treated, and this is the part that is released. And they come from, as you might expect, from the major industries in the country. An awful lot is metal mining, which was added more recently. That was not on the original TRI list. That was an awful lot of stuff released from mining metals. Electric utilities, well, that's coal-fired power plants, uh, again, substantially. Now, chemical industry, not surprising, primary metals and paper in Wisconsin, we've got a lot of paper mills, the biggest concentration in the world, right along the Fox River, and that's of concern. And then it's a scattering of other industries. So not all industries release it. Then again, if you look at, so uh, the EPA and its latest TRA releases will say, well, releases are down over time. You can, if you look at the categories, so there's land and, and here is, uh, what am I looking for? Uh, Oh, total offsite releases, land disposal, underground injection, surface, oh, air releases, yes, this kind. That's pretty impressive down there. Some of the other categories don't look like they decreased all that much over time. So you, when you see the total figures, this breaks it down into where has the decline been, and I think it's been substantially in releases to the air. And here you even see it ticked up a bit recently. So these are, again, you can find this very easy if you download the full TRI report, and they're on the, the slide for you to ponder. Uh, I was particularly struck by, so they didn't used to have this in the TRI reports. Now they show a 50% decrease in carcinogens in the air 2003 to 2011. There you see it. Although it's still not zero. Uh, you might wonder, why are companies releasing carcinogens to the air? Can't they capture this stuff before it goes into the air? And I think they would say not easily or economically. And so, and many would argue it doesn't matter because if it goes into the air, it's widely dispersed. This is the old uh, uh, dilution is the solution to pollution argument. And that's true if you look at various ways we have a measuring. As long as there's a big quantity of air and it moves stuff around, then your actual exposure is so low, it may not be worth removing uh, that last bit. I'm going to talk a bit about RESI scores. Now, so far, and historically, what people paid attention to in TRI disclosures is pounds of chemicals released. If you go look at any given company, you will see how many tens of thousands of pounds of uh, some chemical you've never heard of, but or maybe something like hydrochloric acid. Or in paper companies, it's hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid. What does that mean? Well, it's toxic chemical by definition, so it can't mean it's good for you. Uh, is it unhealthy? Uh, in very small quantities, hard to say, in large quantities, probably. That's why we call them toxic. So what you want is a measure of health impact. And EPA actually does have a model. It's a computer model for doing this. It's not widely publicized. It's not easily available. But now I was struck by the, this year's report that they actually showed the RESI scores. Uh, so what is RESI? RESI applies to 
It should be only air quality unless they've changed since we did our study. RESI is actually a computer model that looks at the, not only the chemicals being released, but which smokestacks they're coming from, where they're located, the, how the plume goes up and spreads, and, the, and people who live within a certain distance. So it calculates an exposure score, not just pounds released. You definitely want to know about exposure because that's all, the health effects of chemicals come from exposure, not pounds of chemicals released. If the water's polluted but you don't drink the water, then it's not a health risk. Well, you may eat the fish from the river, in the case of Wisconsin, <laughs> you get it from the, in fact, the total, the PCB contamination in the Fox River in Wisconsin comes exclusively from eating fish in the river, not from crossing the river, drinking water from the river, it's too dilute. And that's true of a lot of toxic chemicals in Lake Michigan. It's only when you eat the fish because it's bioconcentrated as a, as a food chain. It's, it's comforting that Resi is going down, except a little uptick there, that it's not a consistent pattern. So that, with that background, uh, background to TRI, you can see what intrigued us, which is, wait a minute, okay, so the numbers have gone down over time, but why did they go down? What mechanism would lead them to go down? That is, did people get excited about the information and petition the local companies? And did local officials get involved? Did the state regulatory agencies crack down on companies? Nobody really knows that. As I said, the EPA doesn't know. They just required release of it. It's a non-regulatory program. They're not required to regulate. They just require that the information be released. So we also want to know, too, did the companies think this is an enormous burden? Because we had a, a major effort late in the Bush administration, a so-called burden reduction rule that was going to shift from the annual reports to a biannual report and make it a little easier on industry. And that intrigued us. Do companies really think this is a burden? And is it less of a burden today than it was initially? Because you kind of, you get used to filing reports after all, and so you expect this will get better over time. And that might apply to natural gas fracking as well. So we, we had a number of objectives. We wanted to know what mechanisms were at play, what the facilities thought about it. We wanted to know what state and federal officials thought about it. Were they happy with the way it was going? Did they see some way to improve this? And we wanted to know uh, what lessons there might be uh, for, well, we didn't, when we did the study, now we might want to know, are there lessons for other kinds of information disclosure? In the book, we did mention the greenhouse gas inventory report, and some others thought, well, since TRI has been around the longest, maybe there are some lessons for how it will apply elsewhere. Uh, I'll skip over most of this. This is the model that we use. The assumption is you start with disclosure, and our assumption is, uh, we use the word capacity a lot, that companies will have a different capacity to compile and release information and act on it. Large and small companies, for example, rich and poor companies. And, uh, there may be a different reaction economically. Communities and states are going to differ a lot, so we talk about the capacity to uh, use information. And, and then we assume this will affect corporate decisions to, for example, cut back on releases, to search for alternative chemicals that are less toxic, find ways of altering production processes so that the wastewater is not contaminated. That's actually pretty easy to do uh, these days. So the design was, uh, no, it's a little hard to read from. Uh, <clears throat> We wanted to make this pretty comprehensive, and given my limited time, I'm going to rush through a lot of this on the findings so that we can get to the implications for fracking, and you can read this on your own. We looked at all the TRI releases for the entire country from 91 to 2000. If somebody wants to ask later, I'll tell you why those time periods. But if we thought of a more typical, we didn't want to go early on. It was too early. Things are less settled. We didn't want to, uh, uh, we, we wanted a period that made some sense. We, and we look both at releases and risk levels. The risk levels, as I said, come from the RESI model, and uh, EPA was making that available uh, for those who asked for it uh, on a CD-ROM, and you could get RESI levels for air quality releases for the whole country. And then we did surveys, which is, can be, as Chris knows, very time-consuming and expensive to do. But we did surveys. We sent out about a thou over 1,000 surveys to a sample of we took very systematically from the full universe of all companies. So we thought we were getting a, a random sample of all industrial facilities in the country. Uh, we got 24% return on corporate, and if you know return rate, that's low, but for corporate surveys, it's actually not bad. Corporate people don't return surveys. They think we academics are just pestering them with useless requests. Uh, so I, that's actually about as high as I've ever seen in a corporate survey. We, had, we did much better, 58% for state officials and 80% of the uh, EPA, well, only 10, 10 regions. It was the, the lead TRI person in each region. Uh, and then we did some case studies. We did interviews with, uh, to follow up on, on this. 
We had intended also to do community activist interviews. That part fell apart because we couldn't identify any community activists. <laughs> we started searching. We had this plan to search all the local newspapers around the country. We sent out inquiries to environment groups. Who's been the leading people on this? And just nobody could think of anybody who was an activist on TRI. So we said, this isn't, this isn't going to work. As a, so we decided we would do without that. It would come up case studies. And I can tell you already, as I'll anticipate one later slide, when we ask company officials, how often do you hear from local community activists, the answer pretty much is never. That's why we had trouble locating activists. There just weren't any uh, that we could find. What we found is, again, very useful to know because the assumption, I believe, is when you talk about companies or natu natural gas fracking operations, like they're all the same. What we find is, no, no, they're not at all the same. They're very different. We categorized them as we uh, looked at their trends over time, over that 10-year period, into green, blue, yellow, and brown. Okay. Green are the good guys, they're at the top of the list. They decreased their releases, but they also decreased their risk. And that was 42% of the country, if you will, out of the sample. The blue, they increased their releases, but they lowered their risk. I'd say, how's that possible? Because what they increased were less toxic chemicals for taking toxicity into account. Uh, the yellow decreased releases, but actually went higher on the risk. And, and the brown went in the wrong direction, you might say, on both. They increased the re releases and increased the risk. Okay, so let me paint this picture for you. Overall, we have this 61% decline in the TRI emissions, which makes you think the whole country is moving in the right direction. But that's a mix of very different kinds of companies. If you will, to simplify this, half the companies are getting better and half are getting worse. But the ones that are getting better had the bigger decreases. And so t EPA can say, we have this impressive decline over time. I look at it and say, you still got a problem. You got a whole bunch of companies that are going in the wrong direction. So what can you do to turn them around? What do they need? Do they need regulation? Do they need technical assistance, economic assistance? And by, uh, part of the logic of the book, we have a chapter on, uh, on leaders and a chapter on leggers. We thought, we're, oh, this is neat. We're going to find out. The variables that make leaders leaders and the variables that make leaders didn't work. We could not identify a cluster of variables that, for those who know statistics, we just couldn't get the R squared. There was no obvious explanation for why there was the difference between the two. Um, and, and that we ended by saying somebody else can do this in the future to figure out why there's that difference. And you will see that uh, on this uh, as well. So here's the uh, you know, safer, riskier, increasing, decreasing. So you can substitute chemicals. You can change pollution control equipment. And um, I think the lesson here is don't think uniformity of companies. Think typologies. Think different capacities to use information and make progress. And here you can see it shows up here when we asked about environmental expertise. And of course, we're dealing, we're not dealing with CEOs. And so we're dealing with the people who actually file the TRI reports. That was our audience. But we assumed they were sort of speaking for the company. And when we did our follow-up interviews, we often got a sense of that. So people would, if it was a company like, I have no trouble, man, Procter & Gamble, which has agreement. Procter & Gamble is one of those companies, its headquarters makes decisions. And that means Cincinnati, I think it is. So you have a lot of local offices of, national corporations, and sometimes the local offices are making the decision, sometimes it's corporate that makes the decision. And we found differences, and some were ISO certified. These are uh, international standards organization for setting management and environmental standards. Uh, some yes, some not. And, and those that not weren't even seeking to be certified. These, are, I should say, are mostly smaller companies. Certification is a very expensive process, so they, they weren't about to do that. Some had an environmental management system. About 41% did not. Uh, some TRI contact people were sort of professionals in their field. Others were not. Some companies intentionally rotated the position among their staff. Others kept the same person in for long periods of time. So for fracking, I think, there, again, there are bigger companies and with you know, centralized corporate headquarters making the decisions and smaller companies. There are a lot of, actually a lot of fracking. Barry and I were talking about this this morning. There are tens of thousands of sites in each state. I mean, there's, there's a huge number of fracking operations. Don't assume they're all the same. You know, they can have quite different corporate you know, motivations. And, and smaller companies tend to be much more worried about burdens and costs. I got on the phone to one when we couldn't get our questionnaire returned. 
And I said, so can you tell me something about that? I said, well, there are only three of us here. So if your image is this is a corporation, they must have tens of thousands of employees. Yes, some of them and others are no. They're really, really small operations. Oh, and I didn't even mention something else I should. The decline over time, we could never resolve whether this was because some companies that were big releasers had closed operations here and shipped them to China or India or Mexico. We got a hint of that, but we just couldn't quite resolve it. But it came up in some of these interviews with small companies that said, oh, we said, gee, you're, uh, you're not filing the reports anymore. They said, that's because we stopped manufacturing. It's in China now. So what looks like an improvement in operations may be shipping it abroad. That is shipping the pollution to other countries. It's hard to resolve that. Uh, given that I have limited time left, I'll say we, we also asked during the, uh, in the surveys and in the interviews of corporate officials, well, what made the most difference as they sought to reduce their releases? And most of their interaction was with facility employees and corporate management, not with communities. And we thought, that's odd, because the, the underlying logic here is communities will rise up and protest once they have this information. Hardly anybody mentioned that, and it shows up as we did the statistics and as I said, there are plenty of figures in the book. It just, nobody was talking about, we did it because the community protest. One company said, oh, we once had an article in the press about a fine from the state agency, and boy, we learned never to do that again. But it wasn't the community, it was the fact that the local paper published the article, and that embarrassed them. And when we asked them, what makes the most difference as you manage chemicals that's limiting legal liability and improving performance and so forth, uh, community relate, desire to improve community relations was way, way down. Uh, at the end of the book, we say what you really need is not just uh, disclosure laws, you need regulation to continue because many companies said we're doing this because we, we, we figure sooner or later we're going to be required to do it anyway. In other words, it, what we call in the book anticipated regulation. It wasn't just the disclosure that made the difference, is that they thought we're going to have to, you know, sooner or later there's going to be a regulation that's going to compel us anyway, so we might as well do it before we get to that point. Uh, and I wonder whether that might not be the same fracking. Uh, this is just an example of, so what I'm summarizing, you can get more details on in the book, and you, here you can see where community relations is well down. It, it's a mixture, and again, for some companies, they say, yes, we did hear from people, not regularly, but from time to time. And, but I would say the, the broader pattern was, no, they don't hear from community activists. No, the press never comes by. They release these reports and nothing happens. Nothing happens. That bothered us. We thought that's not the way the designers of this policy thought it would work. They thought there'd be some outrage from the community. And I can tell you what we found is that did not happen much at all across the entire country. Um, about five minutes, yes. OK. Uh, the effects internally, now we did find that collecting the information, even though it didn't mobilize the, the, the community, it did make a difference with the regulatory agencies. And I'll rush through this. It, they really did use the information, state regulatory agencies, and the companies themselves used the information internally to change what they were doing. So in this sense, you can say TRI was a success, but not for the reasons that the designers had in mind. It didn't mobilize the community, but it did bring about changes, and you saw that in the overall. So they were able to, to get more accurate data, to identify goals, to make changes. Um, uh, and, and by the way, uh, we found uh, most, mostly they were positive or neutral about the program. They were not as negative, I think, as the opponents of regulation and environmental policy generally <laughs> assume. And let me come back to that. Uh, and similarly, as I said, state officials really did use the information. So it, f it fed into the, even though it's not regulatory, it feeds into the regulatory process because now they have some more information to check on what companies are doing. And I'm sorry, I'm going to skip over that. You can read it on your. The implication for fracking, I think, would be that you might need to have nonprofit organizations and public officials help to inform the public and digest the information because it might pertain to regulatory uh, actions. Um, so a lot would happen. Uh, uh, public officials said they didn't take pollution prevention activities. They mounted uh, source reduction efforts. They tried to increase media coverage. They actually brought about meetings. All of this, though, did not come from the citizens themselves. It came from the state officials using the disclosed information to prompt these changes. 
And I think that's one of the most critical findings of the book. People by themselves don't take these actions, but making information public gives the regulators something they didn't have before, right? Even though it's a non-regulatory policy. So for fracking, I think public officials can take significant actions that individuals, I think, can't. So I think TRI does work, but not in the way people expected it to work. Uh, and there's a problem with the metric, because releasing pounds of information Pounds, releasing pounds, information about pounds of chemicals in the air is not meaningful to most people if you can't put it in terms of a public health risk or something that people can understand. So one conclusion we made is when you release information, it should be current, simple, clear, and accessible. You make it complex and unaccessible. You put chemical formulas down and make it hard to locate material on a website, nobody's going to use it. I also think there's a change over time. We found there was a greater use in many ways by community groups in the first few years of the TRI program. After a while, it wasn't news. I still remember a headline in the, my local paper, the Green Bay Press Gazette, front page, the whole front page. Each company and what they released, they did that once. In later years, even though the same companies were releasing the same amounts, it was no longer news. That is, they didn't consider it newsworthy each year. It was the first time it was newsworthy after that not. Uh, I, I put a, a link here to the Toxic Trends Mapper. Troy Abel, in conjunction with some other people at Western Washington University, put together. If you go to that uh, site, you will find a map of the United States, and then you scroll in on a state, and it will show you individual companies. If you click on a company, you will see their environmental performance over a 10-year period, and you will see the risk levels for specific facilities all across the country. It's the only one. Um, Environmental Defense Fund used to do a site that used TRI data and made it available. Then they stopped updating it almost 10 years ago, I think. So this, this is pretty current. So information disclosure works best in conjunction with well-designed policies. I noted that. I think facilities that don't do well can be assisted. What are the implications for fracking? Now, real fast, and then we can talk about this as we finish up. I think uh, it's clear, and Chris will speak to this, public support exists for shale gas extraction, but the public's also very strongly in favor of information disclosure. I mean, I think the polls are very clear on that. I think here, too, I, I looked at the frac focus site, and I understand many of you did. It's pitiful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's impossible to know what any of that information is about. Plus, it's hard to find. You've got to know, you've got to search for individual facilities. Most people won't know to do that. So think of a better way. What is it people want to know? Uh, and how can you make it easy for them to find it? I think the companies may not be interested in designing it that way, so you have to watch. Uh, Sarah Gossman has a wonderful law review article that identifies all the, state, the new state disclosure policies, but I'm a little nervous that states are quickly adopting policies that are minimally effective. Uh, some would call it a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. If you get all these policies in place, that will be it, and the companies will not be inconvenienced in the slightest. You go, what? That that doesn't happen. Uh, make sure that there's a, a periodic reporting, that the information is current. A lot of the TRI stuff is not if it takes two years to get it out. Uh, uh, basically, make, make sure it's, uh, everything you want to know is there. A lot of, in the fracking area, a lot of companies are asserting that they can't release that information because it's a trade secret. And you want to be sure that's not the most toxic material that, you, that you're not finding out about. Uh, where are you going to put that information, and is it going to be easy to find it? Frack focus is not easy. Absolutely not easy. TRI is not easy either. I mean, it, you should be able to type in your zip code, you know, and get all the information that applies to your neighborhood. That would be easy. It's not like that. And it could be. Uh, and there are other problems. The industries are self-reporting data. Is anybody checking up to see whether what they're reporting is correct? Actually, yes. Turns out it's not, <laughs> always. Some environmental groups have actually flown over companies and done their own measurements and said, ah, it's like 30% off compared to what the companies are telling you. Maybe in some cases it's more than 30%. You, you might be surprised to learn that TRI data are not actual measurements. It's, it's, a, it's an estimate based on computer models of what the companies think they're putting out. If that makes you a little nervous, uh, welcome to the club. What you think is, this is hard information about actual releases? No, it's estimated releases that the companies, not a problem. You might get the same thing in the fracking area. So uh, is industry going to deal with community concerns? Will there be somebody who will handle that and report on whether it's done well? How is this going to tie into regulatory agencies? Uh, so in short, if you go with information disclosure to deal with fracking, bear in mind, I think somebody needs to be in charge. The information needs to be monitored. You need to make sure companies are reporting accurately. 
the most significant chemicals really are identified and released to the public. Um, and you've got to watch out for this. Uh, if, State, the reason states are acting quickly is they're afraid something's going to happen at the federal level. The federal government has been prohibited by Congress in acting. If this gets to be a big concern, the feds can come in and then there could be tough, well, maybe not from this Congress, but from another one. There could be tough regulations that would override the, the state efforts. And I think that's one reason. Uh, I think we've talked about that already. So more or less stayed within my time limit, I guess. And Chris, you're going to address the issues later on. So what I, the, the questions we'll be coming back to is, I think there is a strong potential for information disclosure. The public clearly does favor it. Um, uh, it could be, as we found with TRI, maybe you don't stop with disclosure. Maybe you want regulation, for example, on methane releases. On Maybe there should be inspectors coming in to make sure more than is now done, that things are being done properly and that the wells are being dug dug correctly and and uh, the ba uh, what's it called the back uh, back flow what flow back flow back uh, flow back that the flow back and there's an awful lot of water that's coming up so there's a, there's a use of water and there's also contamination of water and in some areas of the country it's made a real mess and and ranchers out in the west have you know have lost the access to the water they used to have so there's a lot of related issues that have to be dealt with. And as always, I think really you need a combination of policy tools. Pretty rare in any policy area from healthcare to environment that one single tool is going to solve all of your problems. So think hybrid or combination, you know, diversity of tools. And, and with that, I will then okay. leave it to Chris. Okay. Okay. I had to rush you a little bit. That more than I thought. Great. Thank you, uh, Mike. And it's such, such a great setup. And thanks, uh, to Professor Crunt and Professor Ray, for inviting me out to, to the talk and to follow up, uh, Mike. And I think, I think uh, Professor Kraft did a great job of explaining the importance of, of information and the limits of information, right? Just having information by itself isn't necessarily sufficient to make it useful for the public. And so trying to, to now think about the context of the work and coming clean, the book, and, and, and where he's, he's placed it, how does that merge with this, this new issue on our, on our horizon or that has arrived uh, in fracking? And that's where I, I'd like to, to pick up today and talk a little bit about, uh, about where we are in terms of public perceptions of risk, disclosure policy related to hydraulic fracturing. Does the, does the public want the information? Uh, do they care about the information? Are they engaged in the issue? Uh, do they think it's a risk? All those factors are necessary if you're going to use information, and not only the limits of how we construct the information, but the willingness to use it and all the things that, that Mike talked about in terms of navigation. So that's where I'm going to take us through a quick 15-minute uh, jaunt, if, if, if you will, and then and to questions. So just think about this. Uh, the emergence of fracking. Just a few years ago, uh, the idea of even having a conversation about fracking, uh, the word fracking. Uh, was not part of our, our vernacular in, in the least, uh, you know, other than some engineers that talked about hydraulic fracturing, the, the real word, the, the idea of fracking was, was not a concept. It would get giggles, if anything, uh, when people used it rather than, than fear or, or some type of reaction. Um, today, the term is, is part of the common vernacular. I think every year when they, when they come up with the word of the year, it was among the word of the year, either last year or, or the year before. It's, it's become so popular, it's used in euphemisms, late night comics love it. Uh, it's, it's part, it really is part of our, our culture in, in a lot of ways. And so, so we're moving in a short period of time, again, you know, maybe four or five years, that's it's pretty dramatic. So the concept itself has meaning and in, in how we use it. And so uh, as much as we talk about it, the public's understanding their, their knowledge about the issue remains fairly limited and often quite <coughs> uncertain in terms of, of the practices. So what I want to do in, in my short time today is talk about a, a few things that, that dovetail with what Mike talked about, about information. And, and to look at public opinion on fracking from, from three perspectives. One, first, is the public engaged? Are they following the issue? Do they think about the issue? If you're going to have information, you have to have an interest in it to begin with. Two, do they think it's risky? Uh, and if so, what are the risks and what are the concerns and, and why would they, they want to know about the information, an, under, an underlying demand, if you will. And then finally, how do, do they want it disclosed? And if so, where and when and under what conditions? Those are, are factors, I think, that make uh, 
information useful or less useful going along. And so that's what I want to talk about in our, in our area of fracking. Just a little bit about, about the evidence I'm going to use. And, and this, the, the, the public opinion data that we're going to use is this, is from a 2012 National <coughs> Survey of Energy and the Environment, NSEE, which is run out of, out of close up, uh, just upstairs, and the Institute of Public Opinion at Muhlenberg College. Um, we did a survey in Michigan and Pennsylvania last fall looking comprehensively at perspectives about fracking, perspectives on fracking. And so if you are interested at all in the surveys, I don't know if, if Barry, those have been shared. They're on the uh, uh, close-up website, so available if you really want to dig into the details and the methods, which I'm going to skip over, but, but very available and hopefully you'll, you'll find it interesting. Um, the context, I think, is important about the two states. Pennsylvania, my home state, is frack central, if you will. <laughs> it lies right over the Marcellus Shale, probably the richest uh, uh, um, shale play in the country. Uh, it is highly engaged. If you've been to Pennsylvania or you live in Pennsylvania, it is everywhere. It's part of our culture. It's part of our uh, our media, it's, it's, uh, I'll talk about it on, on television, on commercials, it's, it's everywhere, it's, it's omnipresent. So it's a highly engaged fracking state, if you will. Michigan is emerging, it's emerging as a, a fracking state. The shale play isn't quite as extensive, uh, the level of, of, of drilling and fracking isn't as high, but as, as someone that has been at least spending some time in Michigan, I'm sure you see it within uh, the conversations and the discussions and, and in the media in the state. I've seen it from, from looking at it and talking with Barry. So they're interesting to look at uh, as, uh, from a public opinion survey because there's, the, the, the populations are at different places with the issue. So finding similarities and differences can tell us a little bit about how people are experiencing fracking. So uh, let's look at it. First of all, this, we'll start with engagement. Do people care about it? Do they look at it? Do they think about it? Uh, if you're going to want information, you're going to have to first have a, a knowledge that the issue is even there uh, if you're going to do anything about it. And, uh, and as you can see, uh, this is, is the level of public attention towards the debate in fracking. How closely have you been following the issue? And you can see a majority of both, both Michiganders and Pennsylvanians uh, say that they have been following the issue, either very closely or somewhat closely. You, you can see, although I was uh, amazed when we looked at this last year, Barry and I, that, that it, was, it wasn't all that different for a very highly intensive fracking state and a more uh, limited uh, emerging <coughs> fracking state, that Pennsylvanians were a little bit more likely, you know, 49, or uh, excuse me, 59% uh, said it's very or somewhat closely compared to 48% of, of Michigan. There's about a 10% gap. But, but I think that gives us a sense that the issue really has emerged in the public mind to the, to the point where people are at least paying some attention to it. Crucial, if you're going to seek out information, you have to have some interest in it to begin with. And I think fracking is now at that stage. It's going to be fun to follow that over time to see uh, how it changes and if it changes. Um, one, one other factor that I think is really important, and I'm going to come back to this in a little bit, is just your reaction, reaction to the term. You know, psychologists tell us all the time, or, uh, how are we primed to accept information? You know, how will frames affect our, our view on an issue once they're presented later? And I think this is an important question. So if we just ask you, when you hear the word fracking, do you consider it a positive or negative when you hear that term now that's become popular? What do you think about it? And you could see almost identical numbers in Michigan and Pennsylvania, places at different places and experience with fracking, but the term itself had very similar views. A plurality of both Michiganders and Pennsylvanians see it negatively. And I'll come back to that later. I think that's really important how we'll think about processing and using information. The idea where it starts, 45%, 31% positive. So the starting point for a lot of people that might know nothing about it or think a lot about it is, is more likely to be negative than positive. And I think that affects how we, how we process information later. Okay, so, so people, we know people are thinking about it, they have a generally negative view, but what do they think about in terms of the risk? And we can, I wish we had lots of time to talk about where, uh, where the research is on this, where the science, the engineering, the public health data, which is just emerging, it really is at an early stage when we're thinking about research on, on, on fracking, but in many ways it remains unsettled. You know, we have evidence on, on both sides. Uh, of the equation of, of the safety of the practice. We have some, some studies that point to concerns. And again, I think a lot of this is going to play out over time. We're, we're early in the process. But it, I would say the, the reaction to most is that 
it's unsettled. And if you look at reports from Graham or NRC or, or others right now, it's, it's, it seems to be in, in that place. However, if you ask individuals, and this is back to our negative, if you ask uh, many individuals if they think uh, it's unsettled, they might say, say no. It's because substantial media coverage of the issue might be framing it in certain ways. If you live in, uh, well, I'll come back to living in Pennsylvania in a second, but for individuals that might have seen documentaries like Gasland or Gasland 2, <laughs> Uh, which portray the industry extremely negatively and the risk and concerns uh, with, with fracking in a, in a very uh, emotional way, you might have certain views. If you look, on the other hand, at public relation efforts by fracking uh, companies and, and, and drilling industry, you might get a very different picture. I live in, in Pennsylvania, so if you turn on the nightly news almost every night, uh, you are guaranteed to see commercials uh, that focus on the positive benefits of fracking and the safety of it. It's an enormous outlay of expense by the industries to convince Pennsylvanians at the heart of the fracking industry that it's safe. All these feel-good commercials slickly produced by Madison Avenue. So there's a framing war going on. So where does the public stand? So if you ask them, it is, do, do most people, do the experts say it's safe? Do the experts say it's risky or is it unsettled? Here's what we find. And I think it's, it's pretty interesting. This is, if you frame it, three, which of these statements comes closest to fit your views on fracking? Do most experts think the risks are high? Do most experts think they're low? Or are they divided on the issue? Uh, most Pennsylvanians think 55% uh, that they're divided. Uh, Michiganders, 45%, uh, a little bit higher, not sure, which probably isn't unexpected here. And a fairly even split on the, on the low end and, and high end of the equation. That, that I, I think most individuals, when they perceive the, the risk right now, are, are unsure about the debate, very much like I think the science and the research is. And I find that, that interesting. So that in, where, where the public is might be, in some ways, where, where the science is on the issue. Um, <laughs> Looking more particularly at the risk, what do people consider risks? And I think that's, that's, that's key. You were, you were talking about, about airborne um, toxin releases as very potent you know, in terms of, of both dispersion of, of, of chemicals and, and where, the, where the public might interact in risk. For, for fracking, especially in a place like Pennsylvania, a lot of the concern comes with water. Right, obviously we're sending tons, of, injecting lots of, of millions of gallons, billions of gallons of water, inject it with sand and, and other chemicals into the, uh, into the surface to produce the, uh, the, the, the gas. Water contamination is, and this is one place where we saw significant differences. Pennsylvanians are almost twice as likely as Michiganders to cite the, the primary risk, what the most important risk uh, is in terms of, of, of the, the practice to be water contamination, we also have groundwater in there. That, that's the, the framing, if you will, where people in Pennsylvania, they don't think air, although air is, is a lot of these sites, uh, there's a lot of questions about the, the, the localized effect of air quality. This issue risk is, is often focused on the water aspects of it. So we'll, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, I want to show a quick, quick series of slides here that I think are, are interesting to look about perceptions of risk and some different framings that we could do regarding uh, the issue. So if we ask individuals, we give them a 10 point scale, 0 to 10, and we say, uh, what is the, the probability that there are serious health risks uh, for people living near drilling operations where 0, over here, 0 is extremely unlikely and 10 is virtually certain that there are risks. Uh, blue is Michigan, red is Pennsylvania. This is what we see. You know, a, 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 a skewed to the, the positive side, and that should not be surprising given the overall negative reaction uh, towards the term fracking. Um, you see a little bit of difference. The, uh, Pennsylvania, actually, I, I find this interesting. You know, of course, the five is, is the, the median uh, and, the, and the modal uh, answer for our, our distribution. Uh, but you'll see a little bit on the, the extremes. Michigander is a little bit more likely to be on either extreme perhaps, you know, based on, not so much on experience, but on, uh, on, on the framings that we talked about before. So I, I find that interesting. But we do a little experiment. We split our sample in both Pennsylvania and in Michigan uh, when we do our survey, and we give them two different framings. And one is we say, what if, in the first, and I'll, I'll flip to this, what if we, the lead environmental agency in your state <coughs> came back with a conclusive report, a conclusive report that said that the risks uh, of health, health risk are very low associated with fracking. 
how would you rate that same question that we ask on the zero to 10 scale? And you can see, and this is what I find, find fairly interesting, and back to disclosure, which is, is, is fun to start framing the questions that, that Michael uh, and his colleagues came up with. Oh, wait. You can see a little bit of movement skewing towards the, the extremely unlikely side, but not dramatic, right? It moves, it moves down, you get more people that, that answer in this category than they did on the, in the, in the un, unframed uh, original question. But look what happens when you frame it that the envir lead environmental agency comes back and says there is a high risk, and that's this slide. Hmm. Moves much more in the direction of individuals saying it's vir virtually certain there is a risk. So, so same agencies, right? Same framing, all the, the random sample that we did and the, and the structure of the experiment. Uh, you can see how it moves things in the direction that people are, I think, primed to immediately expect that the risks are higher uh, and when given that framing, which I think is interesting for disclosure. How do we react to disclosure? How do we think about, uh, about disclosure? I, I thought it was a, uh, an interesting experiment, part of our research on, on this. Um, so, so what do they think about disclosure themselves? What do the actual question when we asked uh, Michiganders and Pennsylvanians uh, about disclosure? And a little bit of context, and Michael has, so, you know, has set this up nicely. There are no federal regulations requiring the disclosure of chemicals for the frac frac fracking process. There's, there, there are none right now. The oil and nat natural gas uh, industry is exempt from the Emergency Planning and Community Rights to Know Act, Ap APCRA. Um, Oh, that, that Michael talked about, the, the, it doesn't apply right there. So there's no standards, if, if you will. Uh, the Energy Policy Act in 2005, Energy Policy Act, major federal legislation, also exempted fracking, fracking fluids from federal disclosure laws. So the fluids that are, are used on, on, the, uh, on the list are not, uh, not required. Uh, therefore, they've turned this over to the states. They've turned this over to the state, and as, as uh, Michael talked about, Frac focus, some states have, have lined up with frac focus as their source for this, uh, as, as a group uh, um, to, to try and, and, and put out the information. But, but largely, again, it's dependent on the states. And the states have different rules. So what, do the, what does the public think about this? Uh, and here's, here's what we find. If you ask individuals uh, with what I would say is, is a framing that is more <coughs> pro-public health, and here's, here's the question. Natural gas drilling companies should have to disclose the chemicals they inject underground as part of the fracking process because the public has a right to know about uh, any health risk that might be posed by these chemicals. We find overwhelming support. The public uh, largely, 81%, uh, you know, strongly agree, high intensity, and then when you put them together, 90%, as, as Michael referenced. It, people aren't unified that the companies should have to disclose. And we said, well, maybe that framing is a little on the pro-health side, so we have to frame it in a different way. Uh, and we do. We take the question, we say, well, natural gas drilling companies should not have to disclose the chemicals they inject underground as part of the fracking <laughs> process because they contend that those chemicals are trade secrets. That if it's a trade secret, we can't give away our trade secrets. That would be against our business interest to do so. And you can see that largely there's, there's no movement. There's no movement, no. slight, uh, slight uh, shifts, but, but any way we frame it, at least in this original experiment, uh, public demands disclosure. Now the big question is, what do we do with that, that information? All the things that, that coming clean talk about, I think, are important. A uh, cu couple last slides here and I'll wrap up. Uh, th th this question, I think, gives you a sense about, and back to Michael's question, well, if, if uh, the idea is, uh, disclosure, where, the, where it comes from, do the companies give us clean information, do they give us good information? Where are we going to get information on this from? So we asked the public, where would you turn first for reliable information? Where would you go first for information about the practices of nat natural gas drilling, either in Pennsylvania or Michigan? And what we find, and this might be back to the original positive negative, right? Where would people go or trust the most? Oops, sorry. Environmental groups in both states. That, that, that the, the number one source where they would turn to first is environmental groups. Much, you know, in terms of the industry itself, a lot of the source of, of disclosure, uh, much less support for it. And I was, you know, yeah. even though the states are primary in dealing with disclosure and, and setting the rules, uh, the states scored fairly low. In Pennsylvania, significantly lower than Michigan, uh, you know, related to well, possible experiences uh, with the issue. Right. So, mm -hmm. 
So some interesting framings. Well, I'll, I'll wrap up there. Michael gave us some really good questions to think about. And I want to be great to hear the question. You know, the public's increasingly aware. Every, every, every survey, we've been do doing this in Pennsylvania now for a number of years, time series. Public's more engaged, more aware, at least on the surface, about the issue. And, and they believe there's division on, on the, the research about the health effects. Um, you know, the, the, the framing, I think, that we'll see so much since so much of the literature matters in terms of fracking, just like it does in, in any issue. Uh, and, and ultimately, while the public desires strong support for disclosure, what's that going to mean uh, in practice? And I think that's a beautiful setup that, that Michael has led us. What is it going to mean if we really do establish these practices and who's going to use it and, and at what level? So with that, I will stop. Hopefully I finished close enough to time. <laughs> Thank you both, Mike and Chris. We're going to open this up, ask Mike and Chris to come up to the panel. And as I mentioned at the outset, we'll go through a sequence of questions. Sarah Gossman, the floor is yours. Assuming Thanks. you have an operational mic. All right, I have an operational mic. So thank you both. This was a really interesting set of presentations, and I learned a lot about uh, information disclosure and what's happening in Michigan in terms of, and Pennsylvania, in terms of what people are thinking. So one of the things I've been thinking about is, um, is this question that you both raise, which is what are people supposed to do with the information? So I love this quote from a Texas regulator when Texas passed its disclosure policy. The regulator says, the Texans will know more about what goes into hydraulic fracturing fluid than they know about the ingredients in their sodas, right? So this is, you know, this is the, the next step forward. And in fact, these um, on frac focus and a lot of these disclosure policies we have a list of the chemical constituents, we have maximum concentrations in the fluid, we have the product names, we have the product purposes. It seems on the face of it to be a fair amount of information related to the chemical use. Um, but then I look at, at some of the conclusions that you draw, Mike, about the TRI, and to me they seem more on the regulatory side, that information informs the state federal regulators, it informs companies themselves by actually requiring them to collect the information. So that could be done within a regulatory system, the system we already have, right, as part of permitting. Um, and it's the, the public piece that isn't mm -hmm. there. And so I, I wonder whether really where all of this is going, even though the public has a deep desire for disclosure, whether we should be heading the straight up regulatory route here and not on disclosure. And let me sort of make one more argument about that, um, which is, you know, given that we have a lot of scientific uncertainty here about what the risk ultimately is, I think there have been some arguments, I'm not sure whether I agree with this, but I'm interested in what you think, that uh, by disclosing information in this way without really knowing about the risks, <coughs> disclosure actually creates more fear, and I think, Mike, you actually brought this up in one of your slides, than it does do any good in terms of public education. So which, again, maybe leads to the question of whether we really should be in the business of regulating the precise chemicals going in and their concentrations <coughs> rather than through disclosure. So that's my provocative question, I hope. Okay. <coughs> Let me go first. Uh, well, I, what I tried to indicate is I, I think a lot of the information that's released, whether it's TRI or for fracking, is sort of by definition pretty technical information about chemicals and concentrations and dispersal patterns. I don't think the average person is in a very good position to make sense of that, so they need the help of state agencies and environmental groups. It was interesting to see Chris's slide that people actually trust environmental groups more than any other. Now, that's not surprising because I've seen many other surveys that say people trust scientists you know, university bait, people who are viewed as neutral, they're not in the business. Um, the flip side of that is, and I didn't dwell on it, but it, it came out in our interviews with corporate officials that they, they fear that if you release information that makes people nervous when they shouldn't be nervous because they believe the risks are low, you've now created another problem. You have a fearful public demanding that companies change their ways when in fact there's really not a problem. In the book, we cite an example of a national study that was released that was really badly done, and it said there were toxic chemicals on school grounds all over the country. And one of my former students was actually head of the Wisconsin uh, uh, office that monitors that. And he said they were immediately called in to go start testing schools all around the state. He said, we found nothing, nothing. 
But communities all across the country were getting upset that now they had a report that said that their kids were being exposed to toxic chemicals at schools. So the other side of this is you don't want to unduly alarm the public if the risks really are minimal. And I, I think you want to have a disclosure policy. I think the particulars of it will have to be discussed. Every state might be a little different. Uh, in my mind, the proprietary chemicals shouldn't be a reason not to disclose. There are probably ways you can do this without releasing too many trade secrets. I think it would be very helpful to have expert panels at the state level to make some decisions about what to disclose, how to disclose it, what the format is, where people can turn to if they have a question about, and it's got to be done so people have some sense of what's close enough to them that it makes a difference. Would I be concerned about fracking 100 miles away? Pro probably not. A block away? Uh, yeah. But maybe, it, maybe there's nothing wrong and people have to have some sources to turn to. And I really think a combination of regulation and disclosure and, and designing the disclosure well so that you get what you are getting and don't make people fearful of everything that's going on if, it's not, if there's not a reason to be fearful. I agree almost with everything that, that Michael said, uh, Sarah. And I think you, you, your framing is really cool because of the, the issue of, of, is it a substitute, right? Is, is it, are we just using it as a substitute rather than a complement for regulatory policies? And I think you, you touched on it really nicely, Michael. How do you, how do you tailor that in a way that, that it's not, that it's useful and productive? Uh, but not a substitute for regulation, which it can't be, right? Which, it, which it, 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 it necessity can't be. So, great question, Professor Karan. Uh, yeah, so so I understand we have the same question slightly differently. Uh, although I'm not going to move quite as quickly towards towards regulation, uh, but basically it seems to me. So you get all this information, you actually don't know how you it's, it's, it's the Truth in Lending Act yeah, to yeah. the third power, right? And if you've ever done a mortgage, you actually have no idea what you're signing. And that's actually something where you have a lot of state principal. You yeah. might want to have yeah. an idea what you're yeah. signing. So um, there's this notion that uh, Thaler and Sunstein proposed in the book Nudge uh, around pricing actually of cell phone plans. They also apply it to, uh, uh, to, the, to the other case, the, the mortgage case. Of, of, a, of a reliable evaluation that can be summarized, in their case, for one statistic of price. One statistic is probably too much to ask for. But could you imagine, as part of the disclosure policy, if you're requiring disclosure, requiring actually, let's pull a bunch of these experts together, including clearly experts from industry, and construct a set of summary measures, you know, maybe they're half a dozen, maybe they're a dozen, uh, that people would come to know what they mean and allow them to change over time, and recognize that the post-processing of the original source data required in such measures is going to be costly, right? This is a this is yeah. an important program for public policy students. It's yeah. a very good idea. <laughs> Uh, I, I, on a couple of slides, I had up the idea about selecting the right metrics and so on. I think this gets to the, the heart of it. it. If you're using lots of different chemicals, as many companies are, and I'm not sure what number we're talking about with fracking, but let's suppose it's a dozen different chemicals, and maybe it changes from time to time depending on the formation. Uh, I guess that would be the reason for switching chemicals. So it would help if a if we had some chemical engineers and chemists and policy people and law people, but particularly those with expertise in the chemical risk to public health and to the environment, both sides of that, to come up with some summary way that everybody can agree with. And that might be a challenge. I, one reason TRI never came up with that is that industry and the EPA probably could never reach agreement on what the proper metric would be. That's one reason they decided pounds of chemicals, which isn't a very useful metric. But maybe we could do better. <laughs> And I think the risk level is the way to go. People don't, a list of chemicals and names that people don't understand and pounds it doesn't cut it. If you could come up with an agreed upon metric about risk to public health, maybe you got a, you know, five, it's like the old Homeland Security measure, you have like five colors or something. <laughs> If it's red, you know, uh, this, this, you need to talk to somebody, or, or when you do a radon test, if you're above four micro, pick, pick up curies, you know, you got an issue to deal with. Some, something that people can make sense of. The lists of chemicals, I don't think anybody short of, you know, those with chemical degrees are going to find that very helpful. Chris, Agreed. Uh, Agreed. Really well said. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm afraid. Sort of at the closing hour. Yeah. There's, there's much more we could discuss. Want to just simply note 
that this is one even in this state that is moving in some very interesting policy directions. There's a regulatory proposal from the state agency to embrace the very frac focus program that Professor Kraft was talking about. We may be looking at direct democracy and ballot proposition, and legislation is going forward in the state legislature in a year in which 41 states have enacted some form of uh, fracking legislation. So we will be continuing that conversation as a community, as a center, and stay tuned for further events in the winter. Before we close, please join me in thanking both Professor Kraft and Professor Kraft. Thank you.